For this video in our series on Anabaptism, I'm here with uh, fellow Bruderhof member Jason Lanzel, who's been working for the last couple of years on a project um, about the early Anabaptists. It's a graphic novel, and possibly the first of its kind. Uh, so Jason, to start out with, uh, could you talk a little bit about the project and why it is you started out on this? The idea for this came up as to try and do something with the early Anabaptist story as part of the uh, 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Why a graphic novel? Graphic novels have proven to be a successful genre in presenting history to younger readers. Um, you look at the success of Art Spiegelman's Mouse story, um, Nate Powell's excellent trilogy, March on the Civil Rights Movement, Persepolis. Other stories have done very, very well in presenting historical tales to, to the younger to younger readers. And what we're hoping to do is we don't want to create a sort of a religious Prince Valiant kind of comic of costume drama with big hats and ponderous beards that you know might uh, put some people off. We want to create something that's that's fresh and alive and you know is accessible. Anything in your personal background that inspired you or drew you to this story? My, my parents were Catholic. I was baptized as a, as a child. And, um, you know, growing up, I think there was a bit of that sort of uh, perception of the path to salvation being something that was a little maybe ominous and a bit medieval in, in, in a way. Growing up, uh, we had the, in religious history class, we were taught the, the Reformation story as part of our class. And there was something in it that attracted me. You know, there was something fresh and new there that these people had discovered. But the presentation that we were given in school it felt very kind of stiff and formal and a bit King Jamesy to me. And later, as I grew up, I just continued to read and study this story more on my own. Um, and then later in life, I married a woman from a, a right background, a wonderful woman. And so that story became very much part of our family's, you know, story and, and, and it's a very proud part of our heritage and um, actually just about a, as part of this project about a year ago we had a chance to travel to Europe and re research and visit a lot of these sites and we brought my oldest son along and it was really nice to be able to, to introduce him to that. So what exactly is it that you feel is relevant about the Anabaptist story for today? They were searching and looking for uh, answers to things which I think a lot of people are, are still do today. You know, there's a lot of um, people still ask, is another world possible? Is it possible to live out the New Testament, you know, in a way that it affects all elements of, of society, you know, political, social, you know, um, it addresses issues of religious freedom, the, the, the ability to practice your faith, you know, the way you feel. And one of the big parts of the story I find very important and compelling is the issue of compromise. Um, it's, a, it's a thread that runs throughout the entire story we're trying to cover. You know, there were other reformers who took, took their reform to a certain point and then they backed off. They said, you know, we're going to side with government, we're going to not follow this through. They weren't satisfied with that. They wanted a completely new expression of faith uh, based on the New Testament, um, much like the early Christian church. The novel is based around the stories of several prominent Anabaptists, so could you talk a little bit about who they are and why you chose them? Well, I've selected three, three stories. Felix Mance was uh, the illegitimate son of a, a Zurich priest, and him and his mother live on the street just adjacent to the Grossmuster Cathedral. Um, as a young man, he goes to school, he learns Hebrew and Latin and Greek, so he's, he has some knowledge. So Felix Mance joins a Bible study started by uh, the reformer Ulrich Swingley, who comes to Zurich with big plans of changing everything. And he attracts a group of young men who are inspired and interested and also intellectual. And together they study the, the New Testament Gospels and get very inspired and enthused in ways and how the, can they bring this to a you know, living reality in the city? How can they change things? And Swingley does initially do a lot. A lot of the church uh, infrastructure gets converted into public works, you know, instead of the, the monasteries are turned into hospitals and there's a food line, they're feeding the hungry and, and, and you know, there's a lot of good, you know, positive change. But Swingley students wanted, again, to, care, to live out the gospel in its entirety. They didn't want to just, you know, fix a little bit and do some nice works for the city here, there, you know. 
they wanted a, a complete um, transformation of life. And so they started having disagreements with Swingley. So at one point there's a division and a very clear division is made when the group that Mance is a part of decides to baptize themselves as adults. And they do this in Mance's home and celebrate a very simple Lord's Supper in the way that the early church would have done it. And then from there, just go out and start preaching and, and telling people about this new way that they've discovered. And it catches on in a very amazing way. And many people are baptized and, and they're breaking away from the church and something new is happening, something very fresh. And then the city, of course, then reacts very strongly. And there's dissertations and they go back and forth and there's, they're in and out of jail and they escape. And at one point they leave the city entirely and go up into the, the highlands above the city. They're preaching in the small towns and villages up there. And as part of our travels, we got a chance to go through these areas. And one of the pretty interesting places we visited was a small cave up in the mountains, which they used for, uh, for meetings, a secret meeting place behind a waterfall. And you gotta go, go up this steep mountain trail and here's this cave. And, and they apparently met with up to 30 or 40 people would be in there. Nobody's gonna stop these guys. And this ultimately leads to his arrest and then his execution. He walks through the market on the way and he, all, he's preaching. The priest that's escorting him to the execution site is trying to change his mind to the last minute. And here's his mother on the other bank, you know, encouraging him, you don't, don't give in, don't, don't stop, you know. And then at the age of 29, he, he's drowned in the river and dies. He's the first martyr of the, the movement. I know the other story you tell is about uh, Michael and Margareta Zattler. So could you tell us a little bit about them? The Zattler story is, is his personal favorite. Michael Sattler was a monk and saw firsthand the depravity and the, the wrong that was going on in, amongst the clergy and was attracted some of the, to the, some of the ideas of the early reformers like Swingley, um, particularly the question of, of the clergy getting married. Um, he married a former Beguin nun, her name is Margareta, and together there was a very dynamic, um, very convicted team. Michael presided over a conference of Anabaptist leaders in the town of Schleinheim, and there they drafted the first Declaration of Faith. The Schleinheim document sort of created a blueprint for the future of the movement. The hope was to create something that would bring the different little groups together and unite them under a, a, a central idea or confession. They did a lot of mission work. They were in a town called Horb, where the, the majority of the town was actually converted to Anabaptism. The town was also very protective of them. They were very deeply loved and admired and appreciated. On the way home from their, the Schleitheim meeting, they're arrested. They're taken back to their hometown and put in the prison. And the town just goes, is not an uproar about this. And they want to, they're, they're threatening to get violent and, you know, to protect the Sattlers because they, they, they were, you know, they cared about them, they, they admired them. So they have to take them to a small village further away, a bit more secluded. The Sattlers are accused of breaking uh, the imperial mandate by practicing their, their faith. They're accused of getting married as former clergy people. So Sattlers condemned to death, not only to die, but to be tortured horribly. One of the things they wanted to do to him was to tear him with these tongs on the way to the execution site. And then he's taken to this field, which we went to, and there's a memorial there now and he's burned at the stake, and all throughout, he's, he's calling out to the people and then challenging them and telling them to repent. And his wife is drowned some days later, and one of the last things she says that she would, would rather have gone to the flames with her husband. And the final story is the story of Jakob and Katarina Hutter, who uh, feature prominently in Hutterite history. Be interested to hear what inspires you about them. Jakob Hutter was originally a hat maker, and he's rumored to have fought in the Peasants' Revolt. It's unknown exactly when Hutter first encountered the Anabaptist teachings, but it is known that he was a very zealous convert. And with the death of the, one of the last early leaders, Hutter emerges as someone who's stepping up. He's a very active evangelist. He's a very charismatic person. He's baptizing. He's preaching. He's going around. And one of the people he baptizes early on is a young woman named Katerina, a servant girl, and 
she later becomes his wife. So Hutter and his and his leadership emphasized the communal nature of the church. It's something that where people came together. They, as part of your baptism, your possessions no longer became your own. Those were available to the church. You know, withholding even a quarter was a scene was seen as a sign of of disloyalty. So a common fund is created in the church to support the widows, to support people in prison, to support the refugees, people fleeing to other countries because of persecution. With all his activity, Hutter drew the attention of King Ferdinand I, who was the emperor ruling that part of the country. And he's a very pious Catholic. He's very determined that he wants to stamp out this Anabaptist threat. Ferdinand's persecution of the Anabaptist movement is very bloody and very brutal and ruthless. Many, many people are dying, many people are being put into prison. So the movement starts looking further afield, then it must be a place where they can go to settle, to live out their faith in peace. And Hutter is commissioned to go to Moravia, which is now the Czech Republic. People have fled there and they've been accepted. Um, the landowners in Moravia like the Anabaptists. Hutter is commissioned to go to Moravia. He arrives there and finds people living in community. He returns and then leads trips over the mountains, bringing people to safety. And we had a chance to hike one of the trails that he used over the mountains. And you could imagine old people, young people, you know, children having to do this at night. And the guide that took us up the mountain said many people died from exposure. In Moravia, Hutter manages to bring the different threads together. He means to provide leadership. It's not an easy task. There's opposition from other people who are assuming themselves to be leaders. Um, but he brings a, a sense of unity to the, the, the settlers there um, in a time when it was really needed. And they live there in community for a period of time, but then the persecution returns. Ferdinand orders the landowners in Moravia to evict all the Anabaptists. So Jakob Hutter and his wife are told to go back to the Tyrol, and they, which they do. And they're finally betrayed and captured. So Hutter is taken to Innsbruck, and King Ferdinand is determined to make an example of him. And he's tortured and, and mistreated and mocked and humiliated. One of the things that they do is they parade him to the cathedral there. The Anabaptists had no use for statues or religious artwork or anything. So Jakob Hutter is condemned to death by burning. He's brought to the Mildes city. There's a, a VIP box looking down. It's called the Golden Estachel, which you can go up into and you can look down on the site where he was burned. There's a memorial plaque there, which we saw. And as he's executed, Hutter defiantly calls out to the, the onlookers, the governing officials who are enjoying the spectacle of his, his death. Katarina continues her husband's work for another two years. She's finally captured, taken to Schoenach Castle, which we visited, and here she's given what they call the third baptism, which was a mocking term they use for death by drowning. Now, what do you hope people will take away from this book, aside from a fascinating look at a moment in history? The last thing we hope is that this book is just a bland retelling of, of a story with pictures. You know, we want it to be something that's challenging, something that's inspiring, as I tried to bring it across, there are many elements to their story, I think, that have a lot to say to us today. And I hope that, you know, as a reader, you can find something in it that you connect to that resonates with you, that, that inspires you in your pursuit of faith or your, your calling to, you know, live in community or to be a Christian in the world. It's something we can all learn from and we could all benefit from knowing more of. Well, Jason, thanks for spending time and uh, talking to us about this project. Um, so far we don't have a public publication date for the book, but hopefully it's uh, soon. It's looking very promising. And if you want to find out more um, about the Anabaptists, make sure to check out the other videos in our series here on the Birdhop channel. And um, thanks for watching, and as always, please like and subscribe to our channel.